You've always thought maybe you were a little unique and a little different. Maybe other people always told you that. Stay with me, and today we're going to find out why. Luke chapter 4, and uh, let me start at about verse 16, and I'll read through verse 21. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue, the church setting of that day, on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. Now that's unusual. <coughs> and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Okay? So the Spirit of God is on me. Because of that, I am anointed. And now this is what the anointing allows me to do. To preach the gospel to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Let's have a little fun. Touch your neighbor on both sides and say, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Distinction. The first distinctive we're going to talk about is that you are anointed. <laughs> Jesus was not the one who had come to be anointed. Jesus came so that you could be anointed. <laughs> and the word of God says you, not guys on stages, you are anointed. The most powerful churches in America are the churches where everybody in the building realizes I'm anointed and they don't leave it up to a hired professional on a stage. And if we all begin to understand that we all are anointed, we're dangerous. We're dangerous. You say anointed, that sounds like a church word and I'm not a church guy. Anointed is not a religious word. Anointing means divine empowerment and divine authorization. If I am anointed to do something, if I was anointed to pastor a great church in the Bay Area, that means God has divinely empowered me and authorized me to accomplish it. That's what that means. It means that God has put everything on me and in me that it will take to do the job. We think that anointing is just for spiritual things. I'm going to tell you something. Some of you were anointed to raise that kid because every other parent would have killed him. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. Not we think about he's anointed to preach or they're anointed. No, you were, raised, you were anointed to raise Johnny because everybody else would have strangled Johnny. You are anointed to build that, but some of you are anointed. Some of you, while everybody chases money, you're so anointed for money that money chases you. And you don't understand that you're anointed to fund the kingdom. You got resources that chase you and you don't even know what to do with it. And other people are striving for what comes to you naturally. You don't understand that's not you. You're not that good. You're anointed. 
And so when you say you are anointed, that is a powerful thing because it means God has given you permission and fully equipped you for a thing. Jesus was descriptive of what he was empowered and he was authorized to do, to preach the gospel to the poor and elevate their life and break the back of poverty off their life. He said to release the captives, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So he said that he was anointed, then he described and was very, very cognizant of what he was anointed to do. The problem is most of us are anointed but don't know what it's for or how to access it. And that's what this series is for. So the first distinctive we're going to look at is, is being anointed. When, when you talk about distinction, you can't talk about distinction without talking about being the exception. When you are distinct and separate, it means you're not ordinary. It means you're extraordinary. You're not common. You're not the rule. You are the exception to the rule. Somebody said, I thought he was a preacher. Roll with me. I'll get excited in a minute. Just, just roll with me. Okay. You're the exception to the rule. Okay. God uses words like blessed to describe you. Head, above, not beneath. Lender, redeemed, beloved, Chosen, delivered, restored, justified, glorified, chosen, healed, anointed. Come on. That's another shouting material right there. And we're going to be talking about these words. And those labels are anything but common. They are not for the common. They are for the uncommon. And they are, the, they are the labelings and they are the brandings that take you out of a crowd and make you the exception to the crowd. So within the being distinct, there is something I call the principle of exception. It is a principle that runs from Genesis to Revelation through the whole Bible. The principle of exception means it may happen to everybody else, but God makes an exception for me. So in other words, when God creates you to be the exception, it means he takes you out of the crowd and he separates you and he on purpose does not want you to blend. Because the price of being exceptional is alone. We are so emotionally needy from dysfunctional families, from abandonment, from betrayals, from relationships that disappointed us. We're so relationally needy. Please hear me because I'm already dropping bombs. That many times you will compromise your uniqueness to fit in. And we have a group of people that we desire to accept us. And so we study the behavior and the conduct that is necessary to be embraced by them. And so we become something else in order to be accepted. And when you become something you're not in order to be accepted, you have gained their acceptance, but you've also become ordinary. You've become like them. And God didn't call anybody in this building to go into a sea of vanilla and blend. But God said, I want to make you the exception. I want them to know you're not common. You're uncommon. You're not just normal. You are special. You are unique. You are different and you are the exception to the rule. And I believe I'm talking to a group of people in this building and online that you've been going through some isolation and you've been going through some aloneness and you wondered what was going on. It was God pulling you out of the crowd and saying, I'm not going to let them dilute the thing about you that is powerful, but I'm going to pull you off by yourself and cultivate the thing about you that makes you different from everybody else. Somebody who believes God's doing that in your life right now shout unto God and say amen oh I feel this thing I'm telling you I feel it I'm on to something I'm on to something ah. alone alone God shepherds were a dime a dozen and David was common God pulled him out of the field because he said, I'm going to make a king out of this boy. King is not common. 
King is unique. Shepherd boy is common. He took him out of the common, but he didn't throw him into the throne. He put him in a cave. Go follow his life. He stuck him in a cave with 200 men. And the Bible said they were all broke, busted, and in debt. So he stuck him in a cave with 200 broke men. And guess what? When they came out of that cave, they were not called broke, busted, and in debt. They were called David's mighty men. Because unique people don't become like the crowd they've been put in. They change the crowd that they've been put in. And when God stuck David in that cave, he didn't go in there to become the complainer. He come in there to empower the complainer and bring them out. And they became David's mighty men who were feared all throughout the land. They were mighty warriors because they didn't change David. David changed them. It was in a cave called Adullam. The word Adullam means the place of the squeeze. So God took him from common, and before he put him into his kingship, put him in a cave and put a squeeze on him. <laughs> and it's hard for God to find these people that are willing to go through the season of being isolated so that God can make you great. Distinction is the latest series from Ron Carpenter. That's why I die to myself and I say, God, whatever you want me to do, show me what your will is. And then I become God wrapped in flesh in the earth. God wrapped in flesh. God wrapped in flesh. Somebody shout, I am anointed. Everything you're supposed to be is already in you. God wants you to discover the real you with distinction. You are the exception. Wave at me and shout, I'm the exception. Oh, there's a distinction that God is making between his people and people who are not. And if you want to be on God's side, put your hands together and shout amen. This eight message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. Your power is not in where you are same. It's where you're different. Why do you have a favorite restaurant? Not because it's like all the other ones, because it's different from all the other ones. Why did you marry him? Why did you marry her? You didn't marry them because they were like everybody else. You married them because there was something about them that was different than everybody else. Do you, so, so your power's in where you are unique, it's not in where you're same. Why did, why did you choose them as a friend? Why, why do you patronize that business? Because there's something about them that is unique and different from all the others that causes them to stand apart in your mind. And you've got to understand that it's all right to be different and unique. I wish you'd tell your neighbor on both sides right now, say, I've been trying to tell you I'm not normal. Tell them, I've been trying to tell you I am not normal. I've been telling you for years I'm not normal. If you've got a husband or a wife, you really need to take advantage of this. I've been trying to tell you. I am not normal. <laughs> Hallelujah. You finally heard him. You wouldn't listen to me, but you heard pastor. I am not normal. The second thing you learn about the principle of exception is not just isolation, but you cannot be an exceptional person and have ordinary battles. I could camp out right there and unpack that the rest of my time. Ordinary people have ordinary battles. They got stuck in traffic. They had a flat tire. And they left the drive through and they forgot to put the fries in there. That does not make you exceptional. Exceptional are those people that are hanging by a thread. That look in the face of their life falling apart right in front of them and with tears running down their face, say, I still believe God can use me. 
These are the people that lay down at night and have to fight fear and anxiety from gripping their heart, causing them to sink into depression. These are people that nothing's going right and everything's falling apart and everything they're standing on is moving underneath them and they feel like they've got no feet on them. Seems like there's some people here who know what I'm talking about. Everybody don't know. If you have been experiencing battles like that, that just may mean that God has taken you to be a candidate, not to be ordinary, but he's pulling you out of the crowd and he said, I gave you an exceptional battle to make you an exceptional person. I gave you an exceptional victory to give you an exceptional life. I pulled you out of the common and I made you uncommon. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? God has been using this principle forever. You go all the way back to Exodus 3. I don't know if you remember what the book of Exodus is about. I, I try not to assume too much. But the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage under the cold, hard hand of Pharaoh. And God said, enough. In Exodus 3, and said, I'm coming to get my people. And he called Moses and sent them in there. And then, because Pharaoh's heart was hardened, God said, I'm going to send plagues. He said, I'm going to break this man down. And this is what he said. He said, I want you, Moses, to tell Pharaoh that I am going to put a distinction between my people and your people. And when he had 10 plagues, and one of the plagues was the swarm of flies. He said, and when the flies come against you, they will not touch my people. There will be a difference. In other words, they'll come to you, but I'm going to make an exception when it comes to my people. Then Exodus chapter 10, he said, there's going to be the plague of darkness. And when darkness comes upon Egypt, he said, my people will dwell in the land of Goshen, and they shall experience light. In other words, the principle of exception says it happens but for me God is going to make an exception so they're going to have flies but the flies aren't going to touch me they're going to have darkness but the darkness is not going to touch me then he said when the death angel comes to take the firstborn he said if you put the blood over the doorpost he said it shall not touch you he said the death angel is going to take the firstborn but if you got the blood I will make an exception some of you it should have killed you but God made an exception the car crash should have took you out, but God made you an exception. Oh, it killed other marriages, but yours is still here because you are the exception. Wave at me and shout, I'm the exception. Oh, there's a distinction that God is making between his people and people who are not. And if you want to be on God's side, put your hands together and shout amen. I am feeling this message, I want to come down there and run all over this building. Hallelujah. Woo. To be distinct, to be the exception does not mean we are better. Please don't let pride or arrogance s slip in that door. It does not mean better, it means different. Distinct, being distinctive does not mean you're better than, it means you're different than. In fact, the Bible calls us holy. We think holy is the people that get everything right. Holy does not mean getting everything right. The word holy simply means separate. The angels are right now, 24 hours a day, at the throne of God. You know what they're crying? Holy. Holy. You know what they're saying? Separate. Other. There's none like you. You are unique. You are unto yourself. You are in your own category. That's what the word holy means. See, God called you holy. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are a group of people that God made a nation separated unto himself. You belong to the country of heaven. <laughs> you see... So it's not better than, it's distinct from. And our distinction is not seen in the experience, but the outcome from the experience. In other words, I may go through the same thing as everybody else, 
but I will come out from it differently. If I hadn't said anything else today, if I ain't said nothing else today, <laughs> the three Hebrew children, the evil king Nebuchadnezzar built an image of gold. And he said throughout the land, he said, when you hear the music, he said, anyone who does not bow down to the image will be cast into the fiery furnace. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't worship idols. They worshiped the living God. And word got back to King Nebuchadnezzar, said, there are three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they have not bowed down. He was furious. He went to see them himself. And he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. He said, and when you hear the music, if you do not bow down, I'll show, throw you in the fiery furnace. And they looked back at the king and they said, oh, king, we will never bow down. <laughs> Don't, oh, we will never bow down to your golden image, ever. He said, for our God has the ability to deliver us. And then they said, but if he don't, we still won't bow down. That's the attitude I wish we would take. I know God can deliver me. I know God can turn this around. But if he don't, I'm going to praise him anyway. If he don't, I'm going to worship anyway. If he don't, I'm still coming to church. I'm still going to be faithful. If God don't do what I expected him to do, I still ain't going to lose my faith and backslide. I'm going to stay consistent, and I'm going to stay with God. Somebody say, even if he don't. Say, even if he don't. <laughs> they didn't bow down. He put them into the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar came, and the Bible says he looked into the center of the furnace. I don't know how it was designed or constructed, but he said he looked in the center of it, and he saw all three of them untouched and said there was a fourth that said that was likened unto the Son of Man. So a lot of people think that was a pre-Jesus form of Jesus, that he showed up as the fourth man in the furnace. Having said that, the Bible, catch this, everybody, the common ordinary thing, you go in the fiery furnace, you're incinerated. The Bible said they came out and not a hair on their head was singed and they didn't even smell like smoke. When God makes you distinctive and makes you the exception, it ain't that you don't go through the fiery furnaces of life like everybody else, but it's when it's over. It may have destroyed everybody else, but not a hair on your head has been singed, and you come out and you don't even smell like smoke. Oh, who am I preaching to? God told the Israelites, he said, when the water parts, the Bible said they walked across on dry ground. How many of you know a sea or an ocean bed is muddy? Silt, mud, sediment. And said they walked across on dry ground. Everybody else walks with mud on their feet, but with you, I make an exception. Why? Because the mud would have represented the slavery they had been in. And he said, when you get to the other side, I don't even want you to have the residue of your past on you. You are not to look like, smell like, or think like anything from where you come from. You're going to walk across on dry ground, and your feet ain't even going to be dirty. Excuse me. I'm telling you, God has made you distinct and separate. High five three people and say, I ain't normal. I ain't normal. Distinction is the latest series from Ron Carpenter. That's why I die to myself and I say, God, whatever you want me to do, show me what your will is. And then I become God wrapped in flesh in the earth. God wrapped in flesh. God wrapped in flesh. Somebody shout, I am anointed. Everything you're supposed to be is already in you. God wants you to discover the real you with distinction. You are the exception. Wave at me and shout, I'm the exception. Oh, there's a distinction that God is making between his people and people who are not. And if you want to be on God's side, put your hands together and shout amen. This eight message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. 
Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. You know what, this is probably one of the last few years of my favorite teachings because it's not only a part of the core values that I believe as a Christian, but it also is so many of the new things that God has been showing me in the Word of God. I hope that you are enjoying this teaching on distinction and we're just scratching the surfaces. We're gonna go deep into this thing. Let me just take a minute and tell you how much I'm grateful for all of you who have been partners for so long. I really do thank you for all that you help us to do. You know that we are viewer supported. You don't see us running Coca-Cola ads. You don't see us running, trying to sell cell phones. You don't see us doing any of that. All you see us doing is bringing you the Word of God from beginning to end. So that means we depend on the people of God to join with me in this cause and love it as much as I love it and help us take it all over the world. Thank you for all you do, your prayerful support, your financial support, your monthly partners, many of you, maybe not monthly, but you're just every now and then intermittent givers. I say thank you for that. And I want to invite a new people, a new group of people into our family. Uh, we do what we do and we take it very seriously. And there's a team of people with me that we believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest message in the universe. And we've committed our whole life to take it all over the world. TV's not the only thing to do, but it is one of the most important things we do. And we want to take it further. We're on TV on many parts of the globe. But one of our next steps is we are trying to find ways to translate these things into these native tongues to the people that we're sending it to. It does no good if you just see me. You might see the spirit of it, but you have no understanding of what I'm saying. And we're trying to put the things technologically and personnel-wise together so that when we do reach another part of the world, they can hear it in the way they understand it. Would you help us as we continue to always try to go further and go to the next level? Maybe you've never given and you'd like to for the first time. Maybe you used to, and you say, you know what, I've let back, I've gotten a little slack, and I want to be diligent again. Well, for your first offer, whether it's a one-time or whether you want to become a monthly partner, we have this gift we're going to send you. And all this gift does, it's not a payback, it's a thank you that says we value the fact that you value us. And we're so grateful for this relationship we're starting together. So many ways I can connect with you. Go to all my sites, Twitter. Um, go to Facebook, go to Instagram, go by the websites, check it out, go to our online bookstores. We got all kind of resources made available to you because at the end, we just want to make sure that we're sowing something in you and investing to make your life better. I'm grateful for our relationship. I'm grateful for the time that you've given us. And I believe that the next thing that God does is always the best. I'll see you soon. Join us every week for another exciting message from Ron Carpenter. And until then, visit us online at roncarpenter.com and discover encouraging resources to help you reach your greatest potential in your Christian walk. And when you visit, consider partnering with our ministry team to help us take this life-changing message to the world. Our goal is to take the message and ministry of Ron Carpenter to a worldwide audience, but we can only do it with your help. And don't forget to connect with Ron every day through social media. Thank you so much for being a part of this ministry, and we'll see you again next time for another challenging message with Ron Carpenter.